Good morning, Grace. Good morning. We uh, are starting a new sermon series today called Follow the King. And uh, as you'll notice, the path is going through the woods there. Uh, that's the path that, the, the narrow path that we looked at last week, last time we got together. And that's the path that Jesus Christ is leading as King. And that's how he presents himself uh, in Scripture. And uh, what we're doing is we're kind of going through uh, the Gospel of Matthew, and we're going to look at uh, seven more pictures, six or seven more pictures of Jesus Christ and what he's done for us. And then we're going to roll right on into uh, Good Friday, Palm Sunday, and then Easter when we celebrate Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. So, um, but for today's text, we're actually, I'm going to leave Matthew, which actually covers this passage in Matthew 9, 18 through 26, and we're going to jump over to the book of Mark and be in Mark 5, verses 21 through 43. It gives a fuller explanation um, of this story uh, of Christ and his amazing healing power. But before we look at the text, let's go ahead and pray. Father God, we thank you so much for your love for us. We thank you for Jesus Christ. We thank you for all that he has accomplished uh, we thank you, Lord, that the life of Christ is recorded in your holy and perfect word. And we pray that you would give us hearts that would uh, be filled with uh, not pride, Lord, but humility uh, as we come before our Savior today and that we will see his great healing power. And Lord, that we would see how you can use us uh, to help further your kingdom. We pray you just give us grace as we strive to follow the King. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, I don't know about you guys, but um, we've had quite a bit of sickness lately. Uh, I think I caught a sinus infection. I don't know if that was mixed with the first strain of flu, but um, I got a stomach bug this past week, and, and back in the fall, I, I got allergies, I think, that turned into to some sort of sinus issues, and um, it's just really given me time to reflect upon illness, upon my own frailty, how fragile the human condition is, and um, this week... Uh, I caught this bug on Thursday, and uh, it laid me out for about 24 hours, and uh, my body ached, and um, we have a f four kids right now, and my wife wasn't feeling that great that day either, and uh, so I'm very needed um, to make the machine work and to keep things rolling, so uh, I was just praying that, that, that God would heal me, and, and he did. Uh, it, it was amazing, and I um, I just see in that time as I was reflecting upon the sermon today and this text which he kind of gave me four or five weeks ago as I was looking through, I thought, how appropriate for this week. We're going to look at how Jesus um, heals um, a woman's sickness issue and how uh, Jesus raises the dead. And so I, I just want to focus on that today. And um, If you are going through illness, which I know probably most of us have, to, um, again, I'm going to touch on this in application, but allow that to draw you closer to Christ, uh, not you, to push you away from him. Um, but we're going to look at uh, how Jesus worked here in the lives of, of, uh, of these people and see Jesus as uh, the life giver. First point we see here is uh, a religious ruler's humble belief. A religious ruler's humble belief. We're going to start in Mark 5. I'm going to start at reading at verse 21. Mark 5, 21, and when Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered about him, and he was beside the sea. Then one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name, and seeing him, he fell at his feet and implored him earnestly, saying, my little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. And he went with him. So you have this scene of Jesus is, is uh, at the Sea of Galilee, and he, he goes the other side, and, and we have this ruler named Jairus that was in the synagogue. And if you've been tracking with Jesus' teaching, he's often teaching against religious rulers of the day. Uh, those guys hung out in synagogues. So you can imagine that uh, when Jairus is in the synagogue, there's a lot of conversation, a lot of chatter about this Jesus, who he was, and the things that he was doing. And Jairus reaches a point um, in his life where uh, he recognizes that this man and what people say he's done is probably the only thing that can heal my child at this point. And so I kind of put myself in this position. I was thinking through my sermon as I was walking through on Thursday, and I'm ill, and I'm laying there, and I'm aching, and I can't really do a whole lot. 
uh, I thought to myself, what if that was my son? My oldest is 10. What if it was my son that was, had gotten in this condition to where he was close to death? And, and I just kind of really started to internalize that and, and how much I would actually need and plead uh, for his life to be saved. And, and so we see that, that this guy, Jairus, he comes up, and I'm, just, I'm stressing today the, the humble, even the position that the people are in when they approach Christ. He, he comes to Jesus, right? And, and he comes to him, and he's, he's probably kneeling down when he comes to Jesus, a ruler of the synagogue. He comes in, and he humbly comes before Christ and says, please save the life of my son. Only you can save him. That shows amazing belief. It shows amazing belief, and it really is an amazing position for this man to be in from this position of authority. But he humbles himself before Christ, and Christ goes with him, and they move with a crowd. So this is a, a wonderful narrative story. So, so we, we move with the crowd, and so Jesus says, okay, let's go. And everybody starts walking, and they get moving a little ways, and all of a sudden... A woman comes up and touches Jesus. Verse 24, the second half there, and a great crowd followed him and thronged about him. Verse 25, and there was a woman who had a discharge of blood for 12 years and who had suffered much under many physicians and had spent all that she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. Now, I know some of you can sympathize with this, but there is probably nothing worse than being ill and having what you believe are funds to be able to cover whatever the medicine would be to get a remedy to the solution, and then you spend that money, and you're no better. Um, you're, you're in a state of just utter frustration. And this woman, at some point, she had means, but she had spent them all and had no solution to her condition. But we'll see how she approaches Jesus. She heard the reports about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, if I touch even his garments, I will be made well. So we see this diseased woman's humble belief. That's our second point. The diseased woman's humble belief. Now, we know that according to the book of Leviticus, everything this woman touched would have been unclean. The seat she sits in would have been deemed unclean. The house she lives would have been unclean. Any food she touches is unclean. If she touches you, you're unclean. You can imagine the isolation that this woman had gone through for 12 years. Outside of just the physical health of not having your blood be right, it's the internal fuel that's, that's running your system. It's your oil keeping everything that's going, supplying blood life to all the different parts of your body. She struggled with this for 12 years, and there's no end in sight. She's constantly unclean, but she knows that Jesus can heal her. The one who made her can heal her. So she probably approaches Jesus, and she had to have snuck in, right? Because she's unclean. Everybody knows she's unclean. She has to publicly declare she's unclean in certain contexts. So she has to kind of sneak up to him, maybe, and she kind of like swiped at his garment. She just touched his garment covertly as the crowd is moving. She comes humbly before him. Verse 29, And immediately the flow of blood dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. And Jesus, perceiving in himself that power had gone out from him, immediately turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my garments? I love that phrase. He has so much power within him that when the diseased person touched him and she was healed, he felt it go out of him. And there's all this commotion going on. And, and he feels that power go out of him. And his disciples said to him, you see the crowd pressing around you and yet you say, who touched me? And he looked around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. So thirdly, we see that Jesus displays his power 
over disease. She comes now and, and, and broken, probably borderline prostrate, okay? So she's already kind of snuck up and touched his garment. Now she's just on the ground, fallen before Jesus, and looks up and tells him, yes, it was me. And he doesn't scoff at her. He doesn't say, well, you made me unclean now. No, you can't make the king of the universe unclean. And power goes out from him, and he heals her disease, Again, show, it comes to my mind that he's showing the, the real intent of the law. According to the, the, the letter of the law in Leviticus, this person would have been left alone and isolated. Jesus moves towards the isolated individual and gives them power enough to believe, to be saved. Then we see that Jesus displays his power now over death. While he was still speaking, there came from the ruler's house some who said, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? So can you imagine? I tried to imagine, you know, this week, I was like, okay, so I go to see Jesus, my 10-year-old son, which is all I know uh, in my own mind. He's, he's at the point of death. I go to get Jesus. A huge crowd starts moving towards my house so he can come and heal her. And then we get all caught up with this other person, this unclean woman who got healed. And now the people come and said, my son's dead. But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the ruler of the synagogue, Do not fear, only believe. And he allowed no one to follow him except Peter and James and John, the brother of James. And they came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, and Jesus saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. Uh, these are probably professional mourners. Uh, there was no way to preserve bodies back then, so they had to have a funeral quickly, and oftentimes people would actually employ mourners to come and mourn for the dead folks. That would, that would Somebody passes away, they would come and hire a mourner, then the whole thing would be done within a 24-hour period. So these people are there, these professional mourners, and they're wailing and, and mourning. And when he had entered, he said to them, Why are you making a commotion and weeping? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. But he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. And taking her by the hand, he said to her, Talitha kumi, which means little girl, I say to you, arise. And immediately the girl got up and began walking, for she was 12 years of age. And they were immediately overcome with amazement. And he strictly charged them that no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat. Just so that you know she's alive. Give her something to eat. So you have this girl. She's 12 years old. She's the same age as this, the same length of time this woman's been carrying this uh, disease, this issue of blood. And she's dead. That must be understood. She is dead. And Jesus goes in and says, no, she's not dead. She's just sleeping in reality. No, I have power to resurrect the dead. Girl, arise. And she gets up. He has power over death. We see this also in John 11, verses 25 through 27, when Jesus is with Lazarus. He's talking to Lazarus' sister, and he said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God who is coming into the world. Jesus Christ has power over death. He makes dead people live. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ today, it's because you saw the death of your sinful direction that we're born in sin, and God says we are dead in our sins and trespasses. And then you know you, you have the sense because through the power of the Holy Spirit, he moves in your heart, you see your need for a Savior, you cry out to Jesus Christ, and his cleansing blood cleanses you from all of your sins when you receive him as your Lord and Savior. Your soul, which was dead, then becomes alive. Praise God. It becomes alive. He takes dead things and makes them live. 
So in application, I want to look at a few things here, a few points of how we can apply this to our lives. Number one is this. Have you humbly come before Jesus and asked him to give you eternal life? Have you been like the uh, religious ruler and like the woman? Have you come on the ground maybe, on your knees, prostrate to Jesus Christ, saying, God, I'm a sinner. I need you to save me. That's the first thing. Jesus will save you. He brings life to dead souls. He is the life giver. Second, I thought, uh, allow times of illness uh, to draw you near to Jesus Christ. Now, I thought about this this week as I was sick, and I don't know about you, but I can tend to get a little frustrated with life in general when I don't function properly. When I can't do what I can normally do, I can tend to get frustrated. But what we need to do in times, especially of sickness, like I was this week, was allow those times to help you meditate on Jesus Christ. Because honestly, on Thursday, there wasn't a whole lot else I could do. So I use that time to focus on Christ. Help, it helps you to draw near to him, not push you away from him. I said this morning, too, that um, I pulled a muscle in, uh, in like my hip area, my lower back, uh, a couple years ago, and um, I was immobile. I mean, I couldn't sit in a chair. Uh, I, standing was okay for me, but I couldn't lay. It would wake me up at night. And they said it would be healed in like four to six weeks, and uh, that just wasn't the case. So at like week eight, week eight I really kind of fell into this funk. It was the winter, and um, you know, I, I just, you just start to grumble, right? When things will start to go your way, and, and I, I just really needed to check my own soul. And by the grace of other brothers and sisters in Christ that, that brought this to my attention, I was able to do that. And just to be reminded that life is about Jesus Christ. It's about following him. It's about fulfilling the Great Commission, being a Christ follower that's making Christ followers, even when we're in bad physical condition or we're not where we physically know we can be. We still need to keep the big thing in focus. So application this week, again, allow times of illness to draw you near to Christ. Number three, this is a big one. Look for opportunities to serve those who are suffering from illness at Grace Church. There are a lot of people that are going through health issues that could use maybe a phone call. Maybe they could use something tangible. But what naturally happens is we get busy with life, right? I know I'm not the only busy one. And then we tend not to look around at those around us or to take care of those that are around us. And I hope that today's sermon gets you to think, hmm, I haven't seen this person in a while at church. Maybe I should give them a call. Or I know this person isn't feeling well. Maybe they could use some cheering up or something tangible or a phone call or prayer. Look for opportunities to serve those who are suffering from illness at Grace Church. Again, Jesus Christ is the life giver. He healed Jairus' daughter raised her from the dead, and he healed this woman with the issue of blood that had it for 12 years. He fixed it immediately when she touched him. This is the power of the Jesus that we serve. Now, it's not always going to end this way, right? There are many of you here that wish you didn't have the aches and pains and are going through health complications, and it's not always going to get better, right? It's, it's the joy of Christian films. They always win with the good guy getting what he deserves, but that's not the way that God works. Sometimes God brings that sickness or that illness into your life for his own divine purposes that, that we will never know. And it's hard for us to see what direction those are going in. But in light of that, that's when we need to be the body. That's when we need to be loving brothers and sisters in Christ and come around each other and help each other because of what Jesus Christ has done for us. He sacrificed himself for us so we should be sacrificing ourselves for each other, especially when each other is not feeling all that they should be. We're going to take a moment and go to the Lord's table and remember just what Christ has done for us. And when we do that, I want you to, to think, just examine your own heart, examine your own soul. Is there 
sins that you need to confess before God. We're, we're celebrating the life giver. We're celebrating the one who died on the cross for your sins. He offers you all of his righteousness, all of his goodness, if you will just surrender yourself to him, if you will confess your sins to him and cry out to him as Lord and Savior. His perfect cleansing blood will wash your soul whiter than the snow outside. It is the cleansing blood of Jesus, and he is a wonderful Savior. Let's pray to him. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you so much for your love for us. We thank you for Jesus Christ. And Father, now as we go to your table and remember the body that was broken and the blood that was shed for us, God, I pray that you would give us fresh insight into Jesus Christ, that we would love him more because of what he's done for us. I pray that we would think about him not only as we're observing communion, but as we go throughout our week, God, that we would be followers of Christ that would tell others about him and the good things that he has done. We thank you so much for your love for us. In Christ's name we pray, amen.